my name is Paul Linden. I have been an instructor about North House for quite a few years and various torches, uh, courses in tool making and woodworking. And um, super excited to, to be able to do this introduction for Joshua. Um, I wanted to say that although Joshua and I only met for the first time really recently and online, uh, I already consider the two of us to be close friends. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced yet that he feels the same way about me, but I'm, I'm gonna try to explain how I came to this conclusion. I know there's a lot of you out there who over the years have enjoyed poring over the issues of Mortise and Tenon Magazine and um, its related content, this eclectic mix of construction, restoration and scholarship and just all together in such a beautiful package. Um, I've been very interested in Joshua's connection with Carpenters Without Borders and the project that brought that group to the US for the first time a couple of summers ago. I appreciate the ability to use the English translation of that group's name. Um, but it's Joshua's recent book, Joined, uh, A Bench Guide to Furniture Joinery. I'm sure some of you have seen this. I hope a, a lot of you have gotten the chance to handle it, read it, own it. I'm, I'm, I've been recommending it to my friends lately. This is what's really cemented our friendship, Joshua. Um, I've been a woodworker for many years and I've read so many different articles and instruction manuals related to foundational joinery. And honestly, reading through your text and the way that um, these, these um, processes were described in, in such an uncomplicated and transparent manner, it really struck me as so much less didactic and just like a conversation between friends. And, and um, I really, I, I've really enjoyed it. And so, so um, that's, been, that's been a treat for me this winter, spending so much time with this book. I'll also admit over the years, many people have tried and you have finally convinced me to start working with hide glue and give up my yellow glue bottles or, or maybe oh, I'm done here. that's all I need. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd have you there. Um, so uh, that's, that's enough from me. I hope that the rest of you will join me in welcoming my very dear friend, Joshua Klein. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, thank you so much. This is great to be here. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, when uh, Jessa reached out to me and asked me about doing this, uh, I thought, you know, uh, I thought if I do this, because I don't really do Zoom too much, um, if I do this, uh, what topic would I do? What would I, what would I tackle? And so I was thinking uh, about what's been on my heart and in my mind and I've, as I've been sorting through this stuff um, that I've been researching and, and working out in the shop. Um, and pretty quickly I had an idea right off the bat. Um, and that was uh, because it manifested in uh, the most recent article in our upcoming issue of Mortis and Tenon, in issue 10. Um, I, I wrote an article uh, which is actually structured as a letter to my three sons. Um, I have three young boys and we, we homeschool them. So there's a lot of uh, craft type stuff in our life. Um, and I wanted to, uh, th basically the story was, I was gonna build a firewood box for my family. We heat with wood in our house and I was gonna build a firewood box. And so I was looking at uh, you know, historic uh, designs and um, just about all of them, they're not dovetailed, they're basically nailed together boxes, rabbits in the front and back, very simple construction. But as I was reflecting on it, I realized that um, a, a rabbit joint, a large proportion, or a large portion of that joinery is actually the nails. And so when I think about making this joint, a rabbit seems really easy, but it dawned on me that I can only make half of this joint. I can only, you know, cut the little, you know, groove. I can't, I can't do the whole thing. I need someone else to make nails for me. And so I realized that part of this joinery, um, I can do dovetails by myself, but when it comes to rabbits, I'm at the mercy of someone else who knows how to make nails. So I thought, man, I better learn how to make nails. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't want to miss out. How come someone else can have all the fun? <laughs> so, um, so the letter was was uh, that was the the story, the occasion in the letter, um, because what I've been thinking about a lot in the past few years, especially, I've been reading 
um, about uh, the philosophy of technology and society, the history of technology, um, and also this, this field of study called media ecology, understanding how media and technology uh, interacts in the world and how we interact with it. So I've been thinking about that stuff. And frankly, it's pretty high level philosophical stuff that it's, you know, I'm not a trained philosopher. So this is really hard going for me. Um, and so it's been a lot of work for me to be able to even begin to understand what these people are arguing. And I thought, wow, this is so fascinating. And it, so much of it resonates with my own shop experience. And I thought, how can I share this with other people? And I thought, this is no wonder these books are 500 pages long and they barely are in English because I, I, this is hard stuff to talk about. So my whole goal with uh, this article and this talk was to try to take some of these really fascinating, astute observations that these philosophers and historians and critics have made and to bring them into the shop and to, to show, to kind of live it out and to practice it and say, this is what this means. So obviously I'm not standing at my bench. I can't show you all these things, but I what I wanted to do is basically walk through some of the things that I've been thinking about and learning about the way our tools and our technologies affect us and, and kind of shape our, our minds and our, our way of looking at the world. Um, and then I think, I hope that throughout this, you'll see um, a lot of uh, tangible, practical examples of how this can you know, potentially play out. Um, this isn't a list of prescriptions, thou shalt X, Y, Z. It's just uh, uh, in the spirit of observation saying, hey, look how this changes things. So um, I also do wanna say, please do ask questions. Uh, you can send them along. I wanna, I wanna deal with questions. Um, there, as I've as I've been digging into this stuff, I found that there's not just some uh, monolithic way of understanding it. There's a lot of debate and discussion. So um, some of the ways I'm going to be talking about things, maybe maybe you never heard before, or maybe this is old hat for you. I'm not sure. Um, so feel free to ask questions, uh, and we can uh, engage back and forth uh, on these topics. Um, what I wanted to do is I was ob observing this, this outsourcing in 21st century life. And for me, this rabbit joint with the nails was a little tiny example of the way so much of our life is. So much of our food and our leisure and our work is outsourced to specialists or to professionals who do that one thing. And so obviously there are great benefits to this. Um, I don't know how to create a zoom like product so i'm grateful that there are people who know how to create that and can you know do these things we can do so much more together when we focus on something but there also is loss in that uh, when we specialize in something and we get so focused on one thing we our our brains are really good at kind of focusing on something and then we begin to lose the capacities that fall outside of that so when we become a specialist we can't really be as good of a generalist and the people that I've been so inspired by seem to be moderately proficient, at least with a lot of different stuff. And I found that it gave them this really broad perspective on life and, and work. And if, you, if they're only really good at one thing, it, it's, it ends up making them unable to see the bigger picture. So that's my whole goal with this is to try to broaden my experience all throughout my life and to try new stuff intentionally so that I can have a broader framework um, so it's the path to mastery for me is not about getting really, really, really good at one thing. It's about broadening as much as possible to see the breadth of the beauty in this world. That's my goal. Um, so a few different things at the, at the front, I want to say um, a few different uh, definitions, the way I'm using words, uh, because, you know, when we define words, it's really important, of course, because words mean something. And uh, especially in, in when you're dealing with philosophy, uh, you can proceed for a long time talking about things. And if you have a different definition of the word you're using than everybody else, they think you're saying something you're not saying. So I want to start out with a few definitions. Um, and they're related to uh, craft and technology, uh, understanding those two different words. <clears throat> and craft, this idea of craft uh, is rooted in this, the Greek word techne, uh, which is Basically, it's, it's related to skill. So it's craft or art. This techne is this ability, this skill in craft or art. So it's a pretty basic understanding. Um, craft is skillfulness. 
And so um, you can, some of the earliest uses of this word craft is in, is actually in word craft, crafting a poem, crafting an argument, right? So it's not just, you know, a tangible thing in your hands. It's a, the, a skillfulness that comes out of you to create something. So it's not just your hands, but it also is from your mind to its skillfulness. Okay. So technology then, uh, you can hear that already, right? I said it's techne is craft and technology, right? Techne is craft art and the ology, the logia is, uh, it's the study of, or the systematic study of, or maybe you could think of it kind of as like the science of. And so technology is the, the systematic treatment of craft or the scientific approach to doing craft, right? And so we have uh, someone who's skillful at doing some work. And then when you systematize it and you uh, maybe mechanize it or you, you make it into a more, a more scientific model, then that's what you'd consider technology. It's, it's taking it to the next level. Um, obviously, I think maybe you're hearing already, or you can get a sense that there are two other words that are related to this that are connected. If we're talking about shop practice, um, two other words that get connected would be tool and machine. Is there a difference between a tool and a machine? Is a machine just a tool that's powered by electricity or some other source? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, what's interesting to me is for a long time, I've thought of tool and technology or tool and machine as sort of synonyms that they're, that they're types of tools. But then I learned um, actually historically, that's not how it's been distinguished, um, that there have been machines around for a very long time before electricity. And even uh, um, machines were considered machines when they were just human powered machines. Like for example, uh, my lathe is a spring pole lathe. So it's got the treadle and the sapling up above my head. That is a machine. You read uh, Diderot, you read any description of this lathe and, they, and Moxon, they all call it a machine. So I think that's important because we think of machines as just you know, like power tools, machines, they're just electric tools. But then we have these other tools, these hand tools. And historically, that's not how it's been thought of. And so I was reading, um, uh, a few different things that brought me to this anthropologist <laughs> of all people, this guy, Tim Ingold. And he was talking about this transition from tool to machine. And people have tried to come up with uh, different, they've tried to understand, you know, it seems like it's sort of this slow uh, evolution from tool to machine. And so some people have seen it like it's, you know, like how do you move from a hammer to uh, a, a guided hammer with power source. So you have a power hammer and that turns into, and it just starts growing. And so some people have explained it in terms of um, like a complexification. It's getting more and more complex. There are more pieces added to this stuff. So that's moving into the machinery category. Um, but Ingold says that's not actually, though that's often true, that's kind of misleading because it's not getting to the heart of the main difference between machinery and tools, um, at least historically thought. And he said, he thinks that's correct. Um, and he says, the difference is not so much the complexity of the thing, although that's there, the real issue is the externalization of the work, if that makes sense. So the work is externalized from the artisan. So, uh, it's, it's sort of if you, you feel the intuitive difference between an ax, hewing with an ax and to remove waste or you know setting a fence on a table saw and cutting that waste off, you feel like you're already starting to externalize aspects of that task. When you set a fence, you're saying, I don't necessarily need to follow the line. I'm gonna keep it tight to the fence and the fence is going to control where that cut is. So you're externalizing an aspect of that operation. And he's saying that's kind of the heart of a machine, whether it's human powered like a lathe because the lathe has two fixed points. And even though my foot is powering it, it's still fixed. It can't not be round, right? It, it is round, it's going to be round. And obviously then there's another aspect where I'm coming in and doing the shaping and, and that part of it, this chisel I'm holding is not the machine, but the machine does the fixed part, right? It's the 
um, it's the externalization. And so that's a really fancy word that is not really needful, I think, because what I liked instead of the word externalization uh, is the word outsourcing. <laughs> it seems a little bit more uh, at my level, right? Outsourcing, we all know um, about um, you know, what it is to outsource something. And so we say, I have this job I have to do. Um, I'll give one example quickly. You know, I know a, a furniture maker, he uh, wants to make furniture for a living, wanted to, and started making kitchen cabinets and uh, was building everything, plywood boxes uh, with hardwood face frames. He was doing all of it himself and realized, why am I making these plywood squares and rectangles just to screw them together? I should find someone who can supply them for me. So then he started drawing them all up in CAD and sending his drawings out to a CNC shop and they cut all the plywood for him because he was just gonna cut squares and rectangles. And it was actually cheaper. You know, he was able to bill less for the job. And so he was, he would drive down and pick up these things and he was getting these boxes. So his job was to put them together, but then he got sick of putting them together himself because he's just screwing plywood together. And he said, I'm gonna hire a friend to help me to do that part and I'll focus on the face frames. And so he was getting more and more jobs because he could make the job cheaper. You know, he wasn't, I don't mean, you know, cheap, I'm saying inexpensive. He was not having to charge as much for this because of all these, the benefits of technology to outsource. Um, and so he ended up doing a lot of kitchen cabinets and he wasn't able, his, his market was shifting. The, the, the whole ethos of his business was sort of shifting and he thought, huh, this is not what I set out to do. And so that's a, a good example of what outsourcing uh, can sometimes turn out to be. But that happens even at a close level too. So if you think of technology in terms of outsourcing, just at an individual level, um, I have uh, three areas that I think of technology um, outsourcing. So, or if we think of our tools uh, in our shop when we're doing something, okay, if I have a handsaw and I'm gonna make a cut, now I have an opportunity to guide that cut by eye, or I could begin to outsource aspects of this operation. So I could outsource the control, right? I could have a miter box that fixes and locks that at exactly 90 degrees. So that's a way to outsource the control. So I don't, or outsourcing the dexterity. So I don't have to be really, really skilled with my hands to guide the saw. I can trust the miter box because it's well-made, right? That's one way we can outsource the operation. Another way we can outsource the operation is the energy, right? So if you move from a miter box where you're sawing like this, you'd move to a, a chop saw. So you're, you get the energy, the power source from outside. So now my arm isn't doing this and this and this, I can pull the trigger and that has the you know rotation that's doing all the cutting. It's at perfectly 90, power source down, chopped. Now they're all cutting a 90 degree shoulder, you know, cutting a 90 degree end, but you can see that the direction is moving toward this certainty, toward, toward this jigging, toward this, um, this outsourcing of control. Um, and that lastly, another way you could outsource uh, aspects of your work would be design. So you can, uh, you can depend on plans or you can um, you know, take some aspect of um, some other drawings from someone else or you know, have someone give you the design and say, you know, I want you to make this for me or you have an architect do the drawings and you say, okay, so this, the, the, that aspect of that work that's outsourced to someone else, or they're hiring you, they're outsourcing to you to do a part of it. So it's not in, in, intrinsically bad, it's just that's the difference between a, a technological way of approaching it, uh, it's, it's this outsourcing idea. So the idea behind a machine is that the operation is externally assisted or guided, it's, it's in some measure outsourced. Now, to my way of thinking, Ingold doesn't, doesn't necessarily go here with this, but um, in my way of thinking, I, I think of all instruments, all tools and machines and all this, any, any, anything you'd pick up to shape the world or a piece of the world, I think of them out on a continuum. So I don't think of it as two buckets. You know, there's, there's the tool bucket and there's the machine bucket. And, you know, we got to figure out which bucket they go in so we can throw it in one or the other and, you know, compartmentalize it so it's one or the other and then you pick a system that's not so much the point 
the point is just seeing that there is a continuum and that all tools fall somewhere on that continuum. And then that helps you understand, what is this tool? What is this tool doing for me? What is it perhaps taking away from me that I might want to do? And what is the trade-off? Um, everything has consequences and sometimes they're intentional consequences, faster, less expensive, more reliable, you know, or sometimes they're unintentional consequences that you realize I used to be doing this and now I'm just, you know, purchasing parts to create something I wasn't setting out to do. So we all, there, are, there are both intentional and unintentional consequences to our choice of tools, our choice of technologies. Um, there is a, a philosopher who I like reading a lot. And I've talked about him before places. Um, his name is Albert Borgman. I don't know that you can see that. There you go. Technology and the character of contemporary life. Uh, Albert Borgman uh, has set up this, this understanding, uh, trying to understand technology. He's very important in the world of the philosophy of technology. Um, and what I like about him is, you know, there aren't that many people that are trying to say technology is the boogeyman, uh, but these are, are critical thinkers. They're people saying, how do tools uh, affect the world? And so what he's pointed out is that um, the, the rise in technology, um, there was certainly technology before the Enlightenment, but when the Enlightenment came up, that was the explosion of technology because you had this scientific approach to the world, this whole uh, mechanistic uh, cosmology, this whole way of seeing the universe as a big mechanism, right? And so it was a mechanical way of viewing reality that shifted in the enlightenment. And so uh, the, a lot of these mechanical, uh, this, this technology was developed during this time, it sort of exploded. Um, and so what he was showing is, one of the main goals in the Enlightenment and this, um, what brought in the Industrial Revolution, one of the, the stated main goals was, was relieving the burdens of the average person, was disburdenment, to take some load off our backs because life was hard and took a lot of work. And so we want to disburden people. And so we, we develop these things to outsource aspects of this, right? And what, what Borgman was pointing out is he said, um, and it did that. It was beneficial. But the trade-off with that, if you keep going, if you continue to outsource, if you continue to shed burden after burden after burden, all of a sudden you realize, uh, I'm sort of, as you go down that path, you're disengaged from your work or from your leisure or from the world. It's a process of disengagement, separation from the real stuff of life. And so he says, you know, technology is great, it's helpful, it's beneficial, but we gotta be aware that we don't live a life of disengagement. And so he talks about focal practices, these centering practices <clears throat> that we need to, to have in our lives to, to bring that back, to offset it. <clears throat> um, one of the main things that's important here in thinking about technology and tools <clears throat> is that, um, is that all tools and technology are, <clears throat> are ecological. And, and by that, I don't mean that they're environmentally friendly, although they might be, um, but that's not so much the point. <clears throat> um, saying that tools are ecological is saying that they have an impact and an influence on um, the, the cultural ecology of our world. They change the world. <clears throat> One scholar has said, we shape our tools and our and there, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat. Hold on. <clears throat> he said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And this observation of seeing that, <clears throat> that the stuff of our lives influences us and, and causes us to think in certain ways. Um, you might've heard people say that tools are neutral and that they're, they're not, good or evil, but that they can be used in either way. <clears throat> and this is often repeated um, sort of so that it's almost axiomatic. It's almost obviously tools are neutral. And so we can use them. We can use nuclear power to create bombs or we can use it to, to you know, heat or to power homes as well. 
And that's true, of course, you, you could do that. <clears throat> but the point of saying um, something is ecological is to say, these things do um, affect the world. Everything affects the world. And in fact, uh, we're shaped by our environment. <clears throat> so if you think about it, <clears throat> I am, I, I think, the, the fact that I think like a 21st century American is not a coincidence, <laughs> right? It's not a coincidence I think this way because I am a 21st century American, right? And so when I read ancient texts or when I read even something written 200 years ago, <clears throat> it's like the historians talk about, they say the past is a foreign country. And that's what I feel like I say, <sighs> I don't understand these people. I don't understand the way they're thinking. And the reason that is, is because we are shaped by our contexts. We're shaped by our environment. We're shaped by our, our, our tools. We're shaped by our friends. We're shaped by our jobs and, and the, the cosmology that we think about the world, our worldview, as it were, how we think about things, we're shaped by that. And so when hundreds of years pass and culture evolves and things change in lives, people come out of that context, they grow up in that context and they can't understand someone from, you know, another country or another generation or, you know, hundreds of years have passed. And so that really highlights the fact that we are, uh, we are deeply affected by our context and what we have in our lives. <clears throat> and so um, the idea that tools are neither good nor evil, meaning let's, let's not demonize them or let's not say they're gonna save the world, it's true, but it's also sort of a red herring. It's sort of a distraction because that's not the point. The point is that is not that you couldn't use something that way. The point is that, um, or maybe another way of putting it is to say, we're not talking about potential use. We're talking about tendency of use. You know, in ecology, um, let's say I heard a story recently from, <clears throat> uh, from someone that they had this pond and they loved the pond and it was just this beautiful thing and the migratory birds came through <clears throat> and it was lovely. And then they got a few ducks at their house, a, you know, a few yard ducks that were walking around and the ducks started swimming in the pond and it was so quaint and nice and they loved it. And then they realized that other ducks saw those ducks and came down and started landing in the pond. And it was great. It was so fun to watch all of these ducks interact. But what was interesting is not long after they started seeing cattails growing, right? And so these, these wild ducks brought in cattails and these cattails started growing up and more and more ducks came and the cattails started growing up. And uh, this person was telling me that he didn't get after the cattails. He didn't know better or he wasn't, he was busy. And so he let the cattails go. And slowly what happened is if you've had cattails before, you know what happens that they, they'll start filling the pond in. So now that pond today doesn't exist anymore, right? It's, it's completely filled in with cattails. It's the pond doesn't exist. And so it's interesting because that's, that's ecology. That's how ecology works. And all of the species, they interact in really complicated ways that I don't think we can even fully understand. But that just means the whole ecology shifted when those you know, harmless yard ducks <laughs> showed up in the scene and everything started uh, affecting other things. Now that's a pretty strong example, but the whole world is like that. And so <clears throat> a few examples um, of this would be, you know, say, um, I'll give two examples. One, if you've read uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden, and he talks about the train, he talks about the train several times, um, but the train coming into this town, and he talked about the people in the town, how, they were relatively laid back people. They were not watching this, the minute hand of clocks. They were not thinking that way. They were thinking, you know, probably more like morning evening kind of uh, frame of mind. And so they weren't in a hurry ever to go anywhere. <clears throat> and he said it was interesting because the train came in to the scene, into the into history. And the train was, it was the part of the technology of the train was the clock, the keeping of time, that everything was punctual. And so the train showed up on time every time it showed up and the bell rang and the people knew 
this is when the train's coming, the supplies are in or whatever. And so he said, <clears throat> he realized that people started acting in what he called railroad fashion, meaning highly punctual to everything. It changed their whole cultural ecology. They started thinking like railroad fashion. They started caring about minutes. They mattered all of a sudden. And so this, this spilled over into the whole culture there. Another thing is you can think of the automobile, right? The horseless carriage. <laughs> Obviously this completely changed the face of the world, right? You have these uh, horses with carriages. And then it, this is actually a really good analogy between tools and machines, right? <clears throat> so you think you have a horse in a carriage and then you just, you have a horseless carriage. It seems like a seamless evolution. And so if you just replace the, the biological power with a mechanical power, you have a horseless carriage, you just put an engine in there. It's basically, it's basically the same thing, right? Well, what happened? It completely changed everything. Uh, all of a sudden people were able to live away from their work. They were able to then, but then they had to commute to work. So, you know, you fast forward through history, you get traffic jams. So then you create the highway systems and then you have gas stations popping up along highway systems. And I was surprised to learn actually the whole phenomenon of fast food restaurants is because of the highway system. That's where that, where that came from. And so now we have fast food restaurants to cater to the, uh, the highways. And so my point, you know, don't mistake, I'm, I'm not saying, and, and therefore that proves we need to go back to horses. That's not my argument. Um, we can debate about whether highways are more beneficial or less. That's, that's not the point. But the point is highways are not inert. They're not neutral. It's not that they don't change anything. It's basically the same thing as a horse. No, it is. It all technologies change the whole cultural ecology. Um, so um, there are a few different things um, with this. I think some people think, okay, I can see that. Um, you know, think of a smartphone or some, you know, the Zoom technology or something like that. And it, let's, let's say you identify tendencies or, you know, we all have heard about the problems of social media and stuff like that. And we think, okay, I know this is the tendency of this technology. It tends to be like that. It tends to divide people. It tends to, um, you know, compartmentalize life or whatever the issue is in your head or the advertising or something. It tends to be that way. But maybe you, want, you say, well, I want to use this thing in a subversive way. I want to use it against the design of it. I'm going to try to get the benefits out of, out of it, but not use the other part of it. But what's interesting about that, and, and that, that's a noble goal, and I appreciate that. I hear that. But I think what's important to remember is that that, um, that idea assumes that we are always conscious of all the decisions we make, right? But but social media companies know that's not how we function. And, and everybody knows intuitively, I, I do things I don't, I'm not conscious of. Um, and so we're, um, another way of saying it is we're, we're creatures of habit. Um, there's a really interesting book called, I think it's like, I think it's a business book or something, but the first few chapters I, I got for these first few chapters about the power of habit. Um, and they show how we are, just wired, especially with all the information around us, we're wired, our brains are wired to, to, to that's called chunking, chunking, it's a crazy phrase, but that our brains take pieces and say, I've learned how to do this, now I'm going to make it automatic. I'm not going to ask you, brain, about how to do this, I'm just going to file this away. So now, when I reach for my mug, I know how to pick it up and to bring it to my mouth because it's, it's something I, my body's learned. I don't have to be conscious of it or driving, for example. And so people call this automaticity, that everything's, that your, your brain builds in this automatic, this list of automatic things it can do. And so it's interesting when you think about skill, someone being skilled and working in the shop. You know, I remember watching a friend of mine, Al Breed, He's a, a furniture maker. And you, when you watch that guy carve, it's like, um, you know, one, one um, uh, psychologist, I think it was, his, he's a psychologist, um, but he coined the phrase that you're, you're, it's the flow, you're, you're in the flow. 
an owl when he's carving he is in the flow it's just you know it looks like he it makes it look easy right that's what we say man you make it look easy well obviously we know carving elaborate things is not easy it's skill right it's but the thing is it looks automatic it's automaticity it's close it's not the same thing as skill but it's close to skill so al's just in the flow in his brain it's, it's almost like there's knowledge that's not just like you know consciousness it's knowledge in his hands and and tools are an extension of our hands that's the main idea of what a tool is and so when he's moving or i don't know if you've seen calligraphers um when they do their calligraphy and they have that that dark ink flowing in that clean white paper you cannot falter you can't shake you can't stop you can't you just gotta flow you have to keep moving and it, I, I love watching that. I love watching a calligrapher because there is nothing jigged. <laughs> there's no help. There are no, uh, there's no way to outsource that. You have this ink that you just, you have to go and you have all the subtlety of twisting. I don't even know, I don't do calligraphy, but the twisting of that, the, the change in pressure to get all of the beautiful curves and the, the variation of thick to thin that you have to have. And so that is craft. That is amazing, Al carving or a calligrapher. And you could say, but wouldn't it be more reliable to try to come up with a carving machine or you know, to try to, maybe you can get someone to write the calligraphy and then you can turn that into a typeface and then everyone can do calligraphy. Well, obviously that's not the same thing. Um, you can have the letters, but that's not the same thing. You're not, when you're using a font, you're not crafting the letters, you're, you're just, selecting which letters will go in what order. So you're crafting the sentence maybe, but not crafting the letter writing. So um, so it's connected with that. Um, and we all know that our, our smartphones have, have changed things in this world. Um, do you remember uh, when we used to stand in line, we would talk to strangers. <laughs> we would ask people how they're doing, oh, where do you live? And that's, that's changed the cultural ecology. Um, and so that's just an example that uh, I think I think I would assume most of us have can resonate with and have seen. And it's sort of like um, when we think about um, the things uh, in our world, you know, you remember you've heard the phrase uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. The hammerer <laughs> sees the world as nails because that's what the hammerer knows. And so to, to, a, to a hammer, when you, everything you have is a, a hammer, then everything is a nail. Um, another thing is, you know, maybe to a photographer, someone who's who's practices photography, they see the world, everything is a photograph. They see opportunities for photographs everywhere, right? So that technology has shaped the way they see the world. Um, also to a smartphone user, you know, maybe, everything could be improved with an app <laughs> or you know maybe everything can be a selfie moment right i mean smartphones give us a different perspective on the world and that's the way all tools are and all technologies are so um in in closing here in the last few minutes um I, i'm really anxious to hear your questions and to, to dialogue about some of this stuff um one of the things i'm i'm foreseeing is um, some people uh, maybe thinking that this is just, you know, the old codger syndrome. This is just <laughs> somebody being grumpy and saying, you know, kids these days uh, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and they say, well, you know, uh, look at Klein. He's starting to get to that age where he's starting to see the, the younger uh, millennials and maybe that's what's going on with him. And I think what's interesting about that is um, a couple things. One is, Socrates, Socrates was very uh, leery of and warned about writing or and having books because he said, books are gonna change this interaction we have. They're gonna change us because they're gonna be outsourcing, I'm using that word, gonna be outsourcing our capacities to memorize things. In the ancient world, I, I don't know if you'll believe this, I hardly believe it, but in the ancient world, it was not crazy. It was not unusual to memorize enormous passages 
uh, what we would have hundreds of pages. From, so by memory, it's in their minds. And so Socrates was saying, we have this capacity to memorize huge portions of stories and, um, and poetry. And we're gonna lose this capacity if we outsource it to writing. Once you write it down, you don't have to memorize it anymore because you, you have it right here, you know? And so I think what's interesting about this accusation of uh, people saying, oh yeah, that everyone complains about the next generation coming up. I think what's important to see is uh, maybe asking the question, was Socrates wrong? Well, no, he wasn't, right? Because I have a hard time memorizing a paragraph. I mean, that would be a huge feat for me, right? Now I can develop that skill. I can practice that. It's not completely gone. I don't know how much hope I have of memorizing huge passages, um, but I don't have that skill because I read books, I, I write, I have a computer that I can type things and save things, I have journals I write in, I have a, a smartphone, I can take a picture of something so I remember it later. And so I'm outsourcing memory. And so what's important is, I think what we have to do is not think about, everybody is always complaining about the upcoming generation. It's important to say, hey, you know what? <laughs> Actually, Socrates was onto something. Our, our technologies and our tools shape us. And so let's be conscious of it and think, what kind of life do I want to live? What kind of person do I want to be? Or, you know, what kind of capacities do I want to develop? And so this connects with what um, Borgman was talking about. Disburdenment is a, is a blessing, certainly. It's a blessing that I don't have to memorize this huge thing in order to benefit from some, a book someone writes. But uh, it, it also limits our capacities to be able to do these things. And so um, these are the things that I'm interested in in, in my work is, um, is moving away from certainty and calculation and outsourcing and mechanization not because I wish it was the old days, but because I'm trying to find that sweet spot where I can dive in deep to engagement. So I can feel my lungs pumping in my chest and have sweat coming down my face and have this ax and say, it's all in my hand. If I don't learn how to use this ax and guide that, I'm gonna ruin the work. For me, there's reward in that struggle. There's reward in that journey to say, I'm not interested. I could do it faster, maybe cheaper with something else, but I want to try to learn how to do that. I mean, who wouldn't want to be able to memorize huge passages and be able to recite poetry from memory? That's a noble thing. We would all be awed. And I think that's, that's the thing about technology is that it doesn't inherently by design provide that or force that opportunity we sort of need to be willing to look at what the thing does and say, I'll take the burden relief here, but you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to take the path of engagement over here. I'm not going to take the elevator. I'm going to take the stairs <laughs> or whatever. You know, that's the, that's the thinking is saying, I need to get a workout anyways. Um, and so I'm going to run to work or something. Um, and so for me, it's not just the physical exertion, but it's also um, hand tool woodworking has this this mental struggle, this, um, this dexterity, I have to be able to learn to guide this tool carefully. And so the whole thing, um, you know, I'm not a factory. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to create a product that can be sold in huge quantities. If that is the goal, obviously you're gonna need to mechanize. You're gonna need to outsource aspects of that to, to do that high uh, quantity production. But because that's not my goal, um, because I'm, just a furniture maker in my little shop, uh, making things for fun, pretty much. Uh, occasional commission, but pretty much it's for fun. That way I can, I can choose to, to operate on my goal of trying to develop my capacities and to broaden my experience. So I started making these nails. They're not great nails, but, um, but they are nails. <laughs> and my next nails hopefully will be better. Um, when I was making this, this box, it was this, this thyroid box. It was so interesting because I went from, you know, I have this woodworking part. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with my tools doing basic woodworking. Um, and so I didn't really think about it. <clears throat> my mind was kind of wandering as I was cutting all the joinery and planing and whatever. 
But then I got to the forge and I stood at that anvil trying to shape this nail and every single motion I was highly conscious of. And I just was trying so hard and I knew what had to be done, but my hand didn't know how to do it, you know? And so it was just this interesting juxtaposition between these two different skills that I didn't have. But for me, the answer isn't to say, for my goals, okay, forget it. I'll just get someone else to make me nails. No, I want to press into that and try to make these nails and try to learn. Um, and that's the journey for me. That's the goal. Um, and I think that the important thing that I, I want to leave here, and I kind of left my letter in issue 10, because this is a letter to my boys, I sort of framed it in terms of talking about all this stuff to my boys when they're older, I'm you know, waiting for their, uh, when they're older to read it. Um, but I left them with, you know, not everything in life uh, needs to be justified by a cost benefit analysis. That's basically what I ended up with. Not everything has to be commodified or, or justified by what's the fastest, what's the cheapest, what's the, what requires the least effort or the least skill. Not everything's like that. Some things are, um, in the words of GK Chesterton, um, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> he just means it, it may not be perfect, but some things are too special to outsource to someone else. And so that, that's my journey. That's what I'm doing. I'm willing to be a jack of all trades, as it were, to, be, to develop moderate competence in all these areas, because that's, to, to me, the, the, uh, that's the path to mastery in my mind. That's the, the fun of it. Um, so that's the, that's the message I have in this upcoming issue. Um, and I don't know if there are other questions there, Paul, um, but uh, I would love to hear your thoughts and I'd love to kind of have a back and forth. Great, thank you. I'm, uh, I know I'm not the only one who would prefer to look at a picture of Grand Murray Harbor and my feet. So I'm just gonna leave my camera off. Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I, and I know Joe can chime in as well, but I'm, I'm gonna read through the questions and just see what we have time for here yep. um, as we go in order. And there's a, there's a nice one to start out with just, um, having to do with um, you, you know, workshop equipment. Um, we have a question here that says, do you have any qualms with the Roman workbench, Roman style workbench? How do you feel about a Roman workbench? Um, easy, one word, indispensable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, yeah, it's, it is the most awesome saw bench you would ever have. I use it as a workbench. I use it as an auxiliary lower table. I use it as a huge saw bench, especially when you have like a 12 foot long board you're starting with. You're not gonna stick that thing on a little saw bench uh, or two saw benches, they're kind of awkward. And so I like this one big uh, bench. So I definitely like those, those low staked benches, the, the Roman benches. Uh, it, for me, it's, it's essential to, to my shop, so. Thanks. Um, the next question I've got here is, um, uh, uh, one of our attendees says, curious to hear your thoughts about the relationship of specialization and dependence on expertise and modern technology and resilience on both as an individual and a societal level, on both an individual and societal level, pardon me, impacts on our ecology as well. Uh, is this my ecology? Is this the <laughs> environmental uh, friendliness ecology? I don't know. I, um, I'm, I, I can only but read exactly the words that are in front of me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say, you know, what I, what I hoped to communicate here was not, um, you know, uh, let's get rid of everything modern because everything modern is bad. We want, to, we want to find that golden period and we want to be living in that golden period. That's not so much my argument. I hope that came through. Um, so there are benefits to specialization um, and I'm very grateful for that. I don't know how to fix my car. <laughs> and it's something that I is on my list. That's something that I want to learn to do, but I'm grateful that other people do. Um, obviously, if I tried to do everything in my life by myself, I wouldn't be able 
to do much. Certainly this, this Mortis and Tenon magazine wouldn't as, exist. We have this um, Shopify is this uh, um, website provider for us. And we have apps that people design so that can keep all this stuff going. We have shipping software and all that kind of stuff is I think really important to be able to, if you're talking in terms of the society level, I mean, my personal interest is in sort of decentralizing the, the powers of technology to try to put this stuff in our hands um, instead of having it, you know, in a few different hands, try to spread it out. And so I think it's great that people can start their own publishing companies. I started this with no school, no money, <laughs> no experience. I had one $300 PC laptop. That's how I started Mortis and Tenon Magazine. And people can actually do that now. And so that's what I think that one of the benefits to specialization and um, these digital technologies that people can do that. Um, but as I said, if everything in our lives goes into that category, I think we're missing out, right? Thanks. Um, the next question here, um, is a plane a tool or a machine? Is it merely a guided chisel? How does this fit in with Pi's workmanship of risk? Yeah, right, exactly. So um, if you're not familiar, those of you who aren't familiar with David Pye's uh, book, uh, The Nature and Art of Workmanship, um, if you are, you can hear a lot of what I said is very much related to Pi's way of thinking. I'm very influenced by him. Mm -hmm. um, so Pi talks about the workmanship of risk is um, workmanship or an operation that's unguided. There's nothing guiding, it's just your dexterity in your hand, mm -hmm. like the ax, say, right? Um, and the workmanship of certainty is something that's to some degree jigged. The outcome is certain to some degree, right? A table saw fence or something like that. And so the way I read Pi, um, I think what Pi is doing is again, not putting too bucket categories saying some things are risk and some things are certainty. But he's saying, because he talks about even in ads has elements of certainty built into it with the shape of the, the, um, the back and then the bevel, it is guiding the cut. The tool itself guides the cut. <clears throat> so even in ads has some certainty in it. So I read him to say all instruments, all tools and, and machines, uh, live somewhere on this continuum of risk and certainty. And so I would say the same thing. I'm, I'm basically just kind of reframing that exact same paradigm. I'm saying tools and machines, right? Uh, risk and certainty. And again, so a hand plane is, some people have said it's a jigged chisel, basically. And it is. The angle of that iron is fixed. You cannot change that. There's no way to manually force it. It's wedged in place. And so you're outsourcing the angle on that, right? And you can then tap it down further. I, I use wooden planes. So you, you tap it down further to deepen the cut or you back it up. And that, the, so the depth of cut and the angle of the iron is fixed. And now all that you have left to do is to hold it still and to push it forward with different strengths. So I would say, um, I have a hard time saying, okay, so that means that this one's tool, this one's machine. Now I would just say historically, um, it tends to be thought, if you look at the old text mocks in and whatever, uh, a machine is something like a lathe where there are fixed points and there's something that's being established that way. Or so maybe like perhaps maybe they would say like a, like the, the Stanley miter box we think of, perhaps that's maybe one of the most simplistic kind of machines. Maybe someone would define that. But historically what's been said is, do you think of the, you know, the pre-industrial cabinet makers tool chest with all the planes and the saws and chisels, everybody throughout history called those tools. And then uh, machine is when you start moving into more externalized work. So that I'm happy with that, but I do see, I mean, I, someone's gonna say, ah, but you know, the, the plane is to some degree jigged. And I, I hear that, that's true. Um, that's the, the path toward outsourcing, so. Thank you. The next question I've got here, um, 
In his book, The Shallows, Nicholas Carr discusses how using a new tool in one domain changes our mental models in ways that extend beyond that particular domain. For example, when clocks became common, people began to conceive of everything in nature as being made up of discrete intervals, not just time. In what ways have you seen your mental models shift in domains other than woodworking as you have surrounded yourself with early American tools and traditional joinery? That's a great question. Um, yeah, in addition to Albert Borgman, Nicholas Carr is great. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't tend to talk about you know woodworking so much. Um, Albert Borgman talks about, he says, he gives these examples of just two examples of practices. He says, running, is one really great focal centering practice because it's kind of hard to outsource that. I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, if people try to, you can run on treadmills and watch digital simulations of a trail, but he would say, no, 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 get outside, you know, engage the world. And he also says, making food from scratch with friends. <laughs> he calls that the culture of the table. So when you're washing lettuce leaves with a friend and you're, you're sitting down to a meal, this is a focal practice. So <clears throat> Borgman and Carr are really good. And I think that to answer the question, how does this spill over into other areas of life? Um, probably the, the I, I wrote a book actually that kind of starts pointing at this. Um, uh, the book, Another Work is Possible is about the Carpenters Without Borders um, project that we had um, a, a, 35 carpenters here from around the world, many of them European. And we had them here and they were building for eight days, right? They were building this timber frame, hand hewing logs with axes, no machine around. They're just axes, hewing these things, chopping joinery. And um, we put them up and we also fed them. So we sourced all of the food. I mean, there were some things like salt and whatever we got from our co-op. Um, but all of the vegetables, all the meat, everything was sourced from farms within 15 minutes of our house. Um, and so, because we, we were so grateful for these people to come, we thought, how can we ever pay them back? Let's just do it up and make them some amazing food. And so um, that's one area of my life that I've seen that, that it shifts, you know, outside of woodworking. When I see my goal is, is engagement. And I wanna see the beauty of this world. It is beautiful and there's so much to see. And so if I, you know, my wife and I have a garden, we have farm animals. I got some, some heritage pigs and goats and chickens and stuff like that. And all those things help me, um, you know, when I'm milking my goat every morning, <laughs> um, I, never, I never grew up that way. And so the first time I tried to learn how to milk a goat, I was laughing and laughing because I know the operation is so simple, right? It's so simple. I could not do it. I could not get milk. And it took me a long time to get that feel. And now it's funny because I, I milk every morning super fast and I just, I'm not even conscious. It's just a simple hand motion. And so that's another area of my life, uh, farming and that kind of thing that I just, I just see this, the sweetness of choosing engagement, opting for engagement. Um, and there are a million other ways you can do it. Forging, hiking, um, my friend is going to climb uh, uh, Katata and he's going to go hiking and uh, freeze his butt off because <laughs> he's choosing engagement. Um, and I just think that's, there are so many opportunities um, there. Are, it doesn't dry up. So those are the ones that I've capitalized on, focused on. And so. Great. I, I, uh, I'll admit my, my mind started working at high speed when you were comparing this idea of automaticity and skill. And as I was trying to, I was hearing your words and I was trying to differentiate that for myself. We, we have another uh, question here that's somewhat related to that. Yeah. Um, uh, an attendee asked, automaticity is what I call embodied or in the body knowledge as opposed to intellectual knowledge. Do you, how would you reflect on that or or comment on that or yeah um so uh ba basically my thoughts about automaticity um are are inspired by a philosopher named hubert dreyfus 
and he is a Martin Heidegger scholar. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Martin Heidegger, but he's talked about technology a lot and you know helps people think about, assess this stuff more critically. Um, but so what he was helping people understand, uh, what Dreyfus latched onto was this, this idea that, um, that Heidegger was talking about something, a, a way of being in the world that's, that things are ready at hand, that they're just, the hammer doesn't exist as a hammer. It's just an extension of your arm, which is actually uh, embodied cognition is a, a field of study uh, that, that studies the way that our brains um, understand like basically where knowledge is. Um, and so um, when it, we're, when we're comfortable, like I have my favorite hammer and I use that hammer and my, my brain knows that hammer as if it was an extension of my hand. So when you pick up a brand new tool or a brand new handle and it feels different, uh, your brain has to learn that and be able to map that into its understanding of your body. So, um, it's, it's related to Hubert Dreyfus talking about automaticity. And what he basically does, the example he brings is he says, now, I, I don't think it's, it's right to say that's the same thing as skill. I don't think it is the same thing, but it's related in that he talks about um, driving is a really great example. When we learned to drive a car, I don't know about you, <laughs> I don't know about you but I, it was really jerky and it's just this simple motion is very hard. And you're trying to parallel park and you're trying to do all these things you've never done before. But now think about it. Now you can drive home from the grocery store and be completely absent-minded, but you are actually paying attention to the cars, but you don't really have to pay attention, if that makes sense, to the, the skill of driving. It's, it's sort of automatic um, in a sense. Um, so that's where it's, there is this sort of line between automaticity, which is just habit, reaction, totally unconscious, and then skill where it's more maybe cultivated automaticity or something. It's something that you have to work at to develop that so that it just is natural and it just looks like it's so easy. That's, that's sort of this line between automaticity and skill or they're related at least is my point. Thank you. I, uh, the next question I'm seeing here, um, how do you balance for yourself the use of tool versus machines? Um, uh, so I, I'm assuming this question is related to my, my workshop, my, my woodworking. Um, so, and I've talked about other stuff, you know, I have the website stuff and right now I'm on my computer where I do all my emailing and stuff. So that doesn't need to be said. Um, I do a lot of that stuff. Right. <clears throat> um, but in terms of my workshop, then um, I have uh, because I'm not trying to sell my furniture and I don't particularly enjoy machinery at all. Um, that was actually my introduction to woodworking was going to school to learn luthery, building guitars. And uh, that work is very, very fine tuned and very, very picky. And also the way I learned was there was a router jig for every single operation. So it's a very different way of approaching, you know, constructing things out of wood from what I'm doing now. So that just wasn't, it's not my interest. Um, now I do think there's a great skill and craft of creating jigs. There's the craft of jig making, if that makes sense. But once you create the jig and you have, let's say you have the miter box or like a, a chop saw, right? Obviously it takes their skill to move your hand maybe, but there are aspects of it that are moving out of the realm of skill because they're predetermined. So for me, my goal, what I'm trying to do with my woodworking is, is not do that, but to dive right into engagement. So I don't, I don't have any machinery. Well, <laughs> that's not true. I have the spring pole lathe, <laughs> right? Uh, but I don't have any power tools. I don't have any machinery. Um, if, if the machinery I have it would just be the spring pole lathe, um, which is a blast to use, super fun. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's what I do. It's pre-industrial tools, um, hand planes, hand saws, you know, um, I rip boards with a rip saw. It's, it's not crazy, it's quite fun. Um, so that's, that's for me, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, now th that said, um, doing some construction, um, you know, if there's some situation where we have to make all these little, you know, five eighths shims for some weird reason, we're trying to insulate something or whatever, you know, I am happy 
to cut five eighths uh, shims through a table saw or something. I don't like table saws personally, but I mean, I'm not gonna saw that by hand to make a shim, a bunch of shims. So um, uh, Mike and I, when we're doing uh, construction, you know, we'll take out a skill saw to do some little construction stuff. Um, but um, in terms of my, my workshop or what I would think of as my woodworking, my furniture making, I, I don't have any of that stuff um, in my shop. This next question I think is interesting, maybe uh, as an add on to some of the content you've shared, um, is the basis of your ideas about regaining control over your work or your environment? Um, I don't think I would say it's, it's about getting control. Well, I would say the ultimate end for me is not gaining control. <clears throat> the ultimate end is joy. <laughs> so stinking fun. Like, why would I want to let someone else do that part? You know? So that's, for me, it's just this obsession with, oh, that's really cool. I want to try that. I want to do that. Um, and so that's the ultimate end. And in order to, to do that, I might, I have to regain some control in some areas. Sure. But for me, it's about joy. This stuff is a blast. Everybody who's on here knows handcraft is awesome. And I just want to do more of it. So that's why. The next question I'll ask is, would you say that technology has a tendency to outsource our ability to engage with a lived experience? Um, I guess I'm not sure that I'm following the question. Do you have any insight into what that might be referring to? Um, lived experience in particular? I'm not sure. I mean, I do think that, um, Sort of, you know, that the, the outsourcing of technology does affect all areas of our life for sure. Um, the, the less I want to take care of my, my life, you know, we can outsource anything taking care of cars, travel, um, education, uh, food, our, our leisure. We could just, you know, when we, if you outsource your, your pleasure or your leisure time, you could just listen to professional musicians play music, but never pick up an instrument yourself. Um, and that's a benefit. You can stream music and that's great. Some really great musicians uh, can be in my hand playing a, a, this really Im immaculate performance. But if I only ever do that, I never pick up an instrument, you know, I'm missing out. I should learn to, to play that banjo in my corner that I keep struggling <laughs> to learn how to play. So um, that's what I would say that, yeah, that it affects every area of life. And so it's just about choosing where you're gonna engage and then, you know, realizing, hey, you can't do everything. And so you, you, there are priorities in your life, but uh, I think it's important to sort of have this focal center that we are choosing engagement in, in some way, at least. Great, I appreciate your answer, thank you. Um, you talked about being a 21st, being in a 21st century mindset. Can you touch about touch upon how you might get yourself into an earlier mindset when looking at earlier um, furniture or craft? Yeah, definitely. Um, this isn't um, necessarily the core of what's behind this talk, um, but the the kind of woodworking that I'm interested in. Um, I, so this is the thing, I would say that there are so many amazing things that, that people have done all throughout history, right? And, and I want to appreciate that and celebrate that. And so for me, my, my starting place is a deep abiding respect for uh, the people who have come before me and, and traditional ways of working and understanding that. And so I start at this place of, you know, trying to be in the place of humility saying, I want to learn from you especially when I see how in what kind of inability I have to do things and I can see what they can do. And I think, I think I have something to learn from you. And so, um, so the, the primary means, I think the most direct way to interact with um, our neighbors of the past, right? Whether it's 200 years ago or whatever um, is with 
um, you, obviously people who wrote things, you can interact with their writings, but for people who didn't write books, how do you interact with, with them? The only thing we can have is artifacts that they left behind, um, whether it's a tool or a piece of furniture they made. And so for me, my woodworking, I'm just obsessed with that idea. And I'm sort of like with the master painters, <clears throat> painting scholars, they'll study master painters and they'll look at every little brush stroke and they'll read into that personality and they'll try to see the time periods or I don't even know how they, what they're seeing, but they're seeing the difference in brush strokes, aggression and calm and whatever. And I, I really do see furniture that way. When you've used these, the exact same tools and you try to reproduce the tool marks, there are certain ways, it's not just the tool that makes the same mark every time, it's the way you use the tool. If it's really fast, it makes a different mark than if you go nice and slow and steady. And so what I've been trying to do is reproduce those tool marks exactly. And what it's done is it's sort of like, a, like a, an, an opportunity to go through time and to feel what someone else was feeling to make that. And so for me, that's the way that I um, wanna interact with the past and learn and get in that mindset is to see pre-industrial tool marks and say, I'm gonna put myself in this person's shoes, try to reproduce this so I can feel what it feels like. And then maybe I can learn about the world around me. And I have for sure. Uh, people who have heard Mortis and Tenon stuff, we always talk about tool marks, tell stories and these tool marks are the fingerprints of the craftsman. And so that's, that's the thing that we see is there's this direct connection to these people of the past. And we're just trying to dive right into that and learn everything we can from them. Thank you. I'm just gonna ask two more questions, Joshua. Sure, yeah. This next one, if there is any gift to be found from this pandemic, is it a forced pause to think about how we bring back some of what we have outsourced for others to do for us and losing some of our humanity in the process perhaps? Do you have thoughts or hopes for what comes next in our relationship to technology versus doing it ourselves? Yeah, um, what I would say is um, I don't know anybody that that is excited about this pandemic, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that there are <clears throat> certainly blessings that can come through. And I think that's what the question's pointing at. Um, but I'll just say, you know, I think that technologies in historic circumstances do change cultural ecology. Um, and so like one example I list in the, the article, <clears throat> as I say, you know, when we got, when I got a smartphone, Obviously, I didn't grow up with a smartphone. At some point in my adult life, I decided to get a smartphone. And um, <clears throat> I realized I could call people, I could text people, I could email people, I could look up something. If, if when my kid asks me, hey, Papa, what is the something something? I can go, I don't know, but I'll look it up. And I can just look it up right away. Um, and so what I realized if I, on GPS, I mean, goodness, I can go anywhere and it just tells me where to turn. That's super handy, right? But what I didn't realize, and I think a lot of us didn't realize when we embrace these things and we put our contacts and all of our loved ones communication with them in there, and we put our email in there, and we put our work in there, and we put our clock in there and our alarm clock in there, we put everything in there. All of a sudden that is the conduit for our entire lives. And so what's happened is it, it really has reshaped life, you know? And so, what I, uh, what I want to do is I want to be able, you know, some people talk about, um, well, here's a principle. This might, and this answer might be a little long. <laughs> um, I was reading this book called The Riddle of Amish Culture. Who understands Amish people here, right? It seems so strange because they have these, um, all of these different technologies they employ. You know that Amish people use pneumatic power to power woodworking machinery? that fits within their way of looking at technology. They're actually really great um, technology thinkers, but because it's born out of practical experience for them. So one of the things that happens in some Amish communities is that they, will, they have decided they don't want telephones inside their house. They don't want a telephone, right? Because they say that changes the, the family ecology, the, the culture in our family when there's 
someone can have direct access into my kitchen at any moment and everything stops to pick that up. It changes the way our family functions. So they said, but <clears throat> we see phones are a benefit. If I have someone get really hurt, I wanna be able to get to a hospital. So you know what they do? They have a phone booth out in the cornfield <laughs> and they use the phone when they want it and they leave it out there. And it, that's a really great principle. Now, I don't have a, you know, I got a phone. I don't have a, a, a phone booth out in my field, but that's a principle that I've tried to take to heart and say, you know what? That's actually pretty wise. The, the, the mark of a wise person is someone who can draw boundaries in their life, right? They're, they're able to say, this is healthy, this is not, this is helping me right now, or I need a break from this or whatever. So for me, I've tried to see like, what are the, what are the boundaries? Well, how am I gonna use something? Where am I gonna choose to set it aside? So, you know, 5.30, I'm done with work, except for this. I, I put this away, phone's on my desk, I'm not picking stuff up, I'm not looking, checking email, that kind of stuff. So what about the pandemic? I think that I'm, what I'm, hoping for that will come through this and everything else I publish and the, the stuff I write in books is that I can let people see how, I, I hope that this is not the new normal. I hope that, because this isn't normal obviously, and I hope this isn't the way it's gonna be from now on. I, I hope that this is a, a passing thing and we can again get together, have a beer around a campfire and sing songs together and work wood together or whatever your craft is. Um, I hope that's what comes out of this pandemic. People saying, oh my goodness, life is so beautiful and so amazing. And I can't wait to give someone a, a hug and to sit around the campfire and sing with them. Um, that's what I hope comes out of it. I, I'm no prophet. I have no, <laughs> no idea what's going to happen, but that's what I'm banking on. That's what I'm pushing for. I hope we all uh, take that on.